Well, it's great to be back with you, and uh, no surprise, your district superintendent has arranged for us to do this just a little bit differently, and that's a good opportunity for me to exercise my flexibility. When I was here last year, maybe a card that looked like this is familiar to some of you. We talked about the amazing opportunities that God had given the Wesleyan Church and how those uh, opportunities had multiplied and we were asking you to join us in prayer as to how to make the most of the opportunities. Out of all the good things we could do, what was most important for us to do? And your conference joined with the other 29 district conferences, hundreds, then thousands of people, then local churches. And you prayed for 50 days, many of you. And uh, this card has been in my morning prayer journal, and there's a number five written on the side of that card because this is the fifth card for me. So I've prayed at least 250 times, uh, asking God to give us clear sense of where he wanted us to go, what he wanted us to do. And do you know he answered that prayer? I just sense it was supernatural. You know, when you think of all the people and all the possibilities and that we could together come to the conclusion that there are two things we most need to be about. Disciples making disciples and churches multiplying themselves. And you'll also notice in your, uh, in your notebook today, in the back flap, I believe, there's a card that looks like this. And instead of adding to the pages in your notebook and killing a few extra trees, we... Uh, we have made a website available for the full story, and that has my report. It includes some statistics. It includes some stories. You can go to that website. And on the other side, if you have the opportunity to put this someplace where it prompts you as a reminder, celebrating every time a disciple makes a disciple and a church multiplies itself until the Wesleyan church has a transforming presence in every zip code. I suspect we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, so I'm privileged to join you. A little nervous about it. You never know what's coming from this guy, but privileged uh, as well. So well, well, I think I'm crackling here a little bit. I don't know if there's anything you can guide me to do. It's just uh, snap, crackle, pop is the way it's going to be. Okay? Very good. I'll try not to move. Doctor, <laughs> Dr. Smith, do you remember the first time we met? 31 years ago? I've, I've tried to block it out of my memory a little <laughs> bit, but uh, I think they ought to hear the story. Oh, it was a snowy day. It was a snowy day. I'd moved to Indiana, mm -hmm. heard about a church growth conference that was going to take place in Michigan. So I got in my car and drove to Michigan and discovered that all the people from Michigan said it was too bad to be driving. <laughs> <laughs> they knew better. <laughs> but there you were, along with your sidekick, Dr. Kevin Myers, as we know him today, and that's where we first met. Yeah. And since that time, our paths have crossed, and you've been a friend and a mentor, and we've uh, shared the journey together. We have. You were in a small building back then that soon became another dream of yours to relocate that congregation. Tell them a little bit about that, uh, that journey. Yeah, we were, for our first three and a half years, I was privileged to be part of the launch team there in Grand Rapids, Michigan, a suburb of, called Kentwood. We were in rented facilities, as so many churches start, and then we built our first facility ourselves, and it was great for our congregation, built some unity. I, I like to say every church ought to do that, but only once. And uh, we uh, built that little church, built it on a piece of property that we thought would be adequate, and then God just surprised us, and uh, the move of his spirit and the uh, amazing growth that took place uh, sharing those years, as you mentioned, with Kevin Myers, we worked closely together. He was on the ministry team for five years with us, now pastors 12 Stone Church in Atlanta. And uh, then we had, uh, just having bought this property, built the facility ourselves, had so much invested in it and realized it wouldn't be adequate for what God was doing and had to relocate around the corner to a property that would allow for further expansion. So big stretch for a young congregation that had poured its life into that place to say, 
you know, it was good for that time, but it's not adequate for the future of what God wants to do. And you were in your late 20s, early 30s when all of this was taking place. Yeah, I was a kid. At that point, we had, uh, after Kevin uh, left and went to plant the church in Atlanta, the first church we helped start, uh, we were a multiple staff church, and I was in my late 20s. I was the youngest person on staff. Everybody was older than me. And I was very jokingly referred to as the senior pastor at yes. that time. Sure. So, yeah. Sure. And um, that church grew until it was making a, a pretty big impact on that city, over three, three, 3,500 yeah, congregations. It, it really became a regional church, which uh, it originally started with a focus on Kentwood. But as God sometimes works and surprises you, a major expressway came right past that property we'd relocated to, and all of a sudden people started driving in from all over. And um, even though I look back and I'm grateful for that, um, it did for a while cause me to take the eye off something that was always in our DNA, which was multiplication. So we ended up multiplying 10 churches out of that congregation, uh, sending out 10 churches when we were there. And they've continued to do that, which is awesome to know that it's part of the church and not just part of the vision I had while I was there. But I just wonder if maybe it had been 20 or 30 or 50 churches if uh, I hadn't taken my eye off the ball during that season. So. You're an unusual individual that have a church like that and begin to give people away and to say go start another church. Many people want to build and be inward focused. What, what was it? What, what helped? Well, it's definitely counterintuitive. And, uh, you know, I started and had a scarcity mentality and uh, was concerned I viewed it as a loss rather than an investment, and that was my initial mistake. Uh, after doing it a few times, I actually caught on that it was very renewing and life-giving for the church because when you send out, and our motto was borrowed from Hallmark, care enough to send the very best. When we sent out people, it created space for new leaders to emerge and take their place, and it kept the, the leadership of the church fresh and faith-filled and, uh, you know, looking back, if you were to kind of trace the growth of the church and you were to say, w when did those 50 people leave? When did those 100 people leave? You couldn't pick it out just because God had a way of replacing it and people stepping up and having opportunities to lead at new levels. So it turned out being great, but, oh, was I nervous going into it, that's yeah. for sure. So, sure. Yeah. I remember different times when we would cross paths. There were days when the burden was heavy and the light at the end of the tunnel was not uh, anywhere in your, your vision. Well, and, you know, the first one being sending Kevin Myers out, who had been huge in our church for five years, and then for him to say, and by the way, can I ask anyone in the church for money? And it was at a time when we had just taken a huge step of faith and, uh, you know, the big building payments and all those kind of things, and uh, to be able to say, gulp, uh, yes, and... Uh, and then to see how God worked through that in the life of our church to cultivate a generosity mindset, an open hand versus closed hand, um, pretty powerful. Sure. So you planted at least 10 out of there while you were there. Yeah. Some of the people here would not have any idea what 12 stone is, how it came into being, or what it's become. Yeah. Which would probably be the largest church that's come out of your plants, although oh, there have been yeah. many, many others. Yeah, it's the largest church in our movement, and uh, it's quite the story uh, because it did not start out automatically growing. Um, God did a deep work in Kevin's life, did a deep work in the lives of that core of that church. Uh, today they'll have 15,000 or so on a weekend in their services, uh, multiple campuses. Um, but uh, during those years, uh, God did such a deep work in Kevin's life to help him to understand that prayer and hearing from God is at the center of any significant movement. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, it was something that to this day is, is just a hallmark of his ministry. At some point in time, you begin to feel like maybe God was through with you and your baby that you had birthed uh, and, uh, yeah. and grown. How, yeah. how did that begin to work inside of you? Well, uh, and about uh, 20 years in, a young couple came to our church, Kyle and Petra Ray, wonderful African-American couple. They had moved from the Detroit area to Grand Rapids. They were newlyweds. And I went and visited in their home after they visited. And uh, th they had this crazy pastor who married him who said, 
You know, the Old Testament says, you know, you're supposed to take a year off from any duties when you first get married. And he applied that to marriage. And so they said, we've made a commitment. We're not going to commit to anything except each other for the first year. <laughs> so I wrote their anniversary on my calendar. And uh, <laughs> on their first anniversary, I called them and said, happy anniversary. And by the way, I'd love to stop by and talk about ministry opportunities. And as that young couple served within the life of the church, um, eventually he sensed a call to ministry. He'd been an engineer. And uh, I think, by the way, sidelight, so many of the people God's going to call to ministry are already in a marketplace role. Uh -huh. So let's not assume that the call just happens when we're children or youth or right out of school, but it can come in our 30s or our 40s, our mm -hmm. 50s. And the more uh, he went away to seminary, came back, we started serving together, and it just became apparent that God had chosen him to be the next leader of the church. And it was time for Jan and I to get out of the way and to be released. And uh, we bawled like babies. Uh, you know, our kids didn't grow up at that church. We grew up at that church. I was 21 when I went to help plant that church. And 30 years had gone by, um, but it was clear. And one of the things I, I prayed about, Paul, towards the end of the ministry, when you've been somewhere a long time and good things have happened, there's a tendency to stay too long and the good that you've done over the years to be undone in the last few years. I saw that again and again in pastors and I, I just prayed, God, made it, make it so obvious that even I won't miss it. And he did it. And uh, yeah, yeah, that was a big change. But it's obvious that God had his, what we call his hand of favor yep. on your life. Yeah. We don't Thank know how we get it. Nope. It's just... One of those things where God reaches down and, and taps certain people, and you responded. But then you moved to uh, Marion. Yep. And somehow got entangled in starting a seminary. Yeah, which was... how'd that happen? <laughs> uh, yeah, totally out of left field um, again. And there was a season between when I was released and when I knew what was next that I called my Abrahamic adventure. Uh, I like to say between the go and the will show, there was a don't know. <laughs> and God had to do that because I would have said my identity and my security were in Christ. But when I was no longer the pastor and I didn't know what was next, wow, wow. And uh, God had to do that work in my life. And I, uh, thankfully, it didn't go on for years. I mean, it was just a short time. And I said, thank you, Lord. But uh, he had to do that work. And then uh, Indiana Wesleyan University called me, said, we're starting a seminary. You kind of got this reputation of starting things. Uh, would you be interested in talking with us? And I said, you know, I've been a, only a local church pastor. I personally believe that's the highest calling. Uh, and... Uh, I've, I don't have one day of academic experience. I've only been a local ch church pastor. And Henry Smith, the president, said, exactly. He said, we want this to be a seminary that serves pastors in any season of life, and we want it to be led by a pastor. So I said, wow, you got my attention. And uh, ended up being there and serving there, and boy, loved how we were able to serve the church and start some programs related to church revitalization so close to your heart, related to church multiplication and uh, God's favor again. And it just... Uh, and it became one of the largest seminaries in the United States yeah. in just a few years. How did how, how'd that happen? Yeah, good question. Uh, I, I think, um, again, God's favor, which is unexplainable and uncontrollable. Um, but um, also... The emphasis on people staying in their context, that the living laboratory was their local church, and we coming to them through the internet or them taking one-week commitments, rather than you come and live on our campus. We just felt it was more important in those years that the dominant DNA in their life be local church rather than educational institution. Hmm. And if you come and live in residence, suddenly you start thinking like a seminarian, living like a seminarian, 
And that's okay in certain seasons of life, but our average age student was 44. And so not only was it economically uh, impossible for many people, we just felt they were better off staying in their local church and us coming to them. And I think God blessed that and honored that, and that's okay. part of why I grew. So there was a favor of God again. Yeah. But as you said, unexplainable, yep. uncontrollable. Yep. And then there was this... Uh, stirring inside that God might call you to lead an organization that had been in existence for a long, long time and uh, was scattered across the country and around the world. What was, how, did that, how did that embryo begin to grow inside of you until you thought this might be a God thing? Well, I love the church, and um, uh, the, uh, being available for that wasn't anything I'd ever planned or necessarily sought. Um, and when I was asked if I could be nominated for the position of general superintendent, as Jan and I prayed about it, we just said we need to be available and willing. Um, and each time God's led us, he's revealed his will in a different way. And this time we had the clear sense, because the Wesleyan Church is healthy, it's relatively free of politics, People are people of prayer. They really do want God's will to be done. That for us in this season, the will of the church would be the will of God for us. And uh, so we submitted to the election process. I was privileged to go through that process with someone I so highly respect, and we work closely together to this day, as you know. Uh, and so I'm grateful for walking that journey and uh, was elected by the General Conference a year ago this week. A year ago this week. Yeah. Right. Now you've just finished your first year, and, and with all the other stuff you've done, you were able to, I'll hold this up for the millions of people that are watching <laughs> on wow. live stream, uh, <laughs> to write a book. Yeah. Um, is this something been brewing inside of you for a while? It has. Um, uh, one of the things you do as you age is you look back a little bit more and reflect, and I... I got to thinking about the offering plate moments in my life where God called me to once again push it all over to him. And uh, I plotted those offering plate moments as the defining moments in my life. And I realized how at each of those points I could choose to surrender or choose to resist. And that just prompted me to, to put that into writing and eventually put those accounts into the book along with, with those reflections. And, uh, and so that's how the book came about. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been a while since I writ I've written. The last book was back in, um, you know, that was published in 2010. So um, it, it was something that had brewed in only a, a while before it came and out. I, I'm assuming they can get this on Amazon or other places. Is that correct? Yeah, you? for a while, uh, the Wesleyan Publishing House was uh, doing a two-for-one because they said, hey, read it with a friend and we'll, we'll provide the copy for free. So, uh, but okay. yeah, it's on Amazon or other places. Very good. Well, now, you're leading this organization, us, and God has put stuff in your heart at the church and God's put stuff in your heart at the seminary. What did you sense that he was beginning to put in your heart for this thing called a, a denomination? Yeah. Well, the first thing was to pray. And uh, that's why the, you know, the focused prayer came about. You know, what, what do we need to do, God, to honor you? It's your church. You call the shots. And I was so gratefully answered those prayers. And uh, what a sense of unity came out of that. Um, I was really concerned we'd come up with eight things and then I'd have to narrow down the list. <laughs> and there'd be conflict around that, all that kind of thing. And, and really, God just gave us two. And they fit together, uh, disciples making disciples and churches multiplying themselves. You know, you know, we got a challenge as a church, and that is we're healthy and we're incrementally growing. So we don't have a problem or a crisis to prompt change. But the issue is we are an incrementally growing denomination. Last year, stats available, more baptisms, more salvations, more attendance than any time in our history. But our mission field, the U.S. and Canada, North America, 
and then 97 countries beyond. In North America, it is rapidly becoming a mission field. In terms of the population growth, in terms of um, the different ethnicities and nationalities, and just the shift in culture to being secular. So, so many people don't even have a frame of reference related to the church. They don't even know what you're talking about. They can't even identify with the experience. And so our denomination's doing this, and our mission field's doing this, and the gospel gap is growing. We're losing ground. And we can fool ourselves with happy talk that says, well, yeah, we're... we're I mean, there are denominations that come to us to find out what we're doing because we're growing in an age when many denominations aren't. But this gospel gap just breaks my heart because that's, that's eternities at stake. I mean, those are people's husbands and wives and children. And without Christ, they're going to hell. And uh, so I began to ask the question, what might God want to do to close that gap? And began to ask, what would it take for us as a denomination to be more of a movement? And uh, as I prayed about it, as our executive cabinet met, as our superintendents gathered, as it just became evident that this was a common burden. I want to ask you a question right here. We, I've heard you mention again and again, and I've been in many meetings with you, where you're talking about Probably too many. <laughs> where you're, no, they're good. Where you're talking about a movement. Help me understand the difference between a denomination, as we have now, and a movement, as is in your spirit and your heart. Yeah. Um, I had to go back to the New Testament, look at the book of Acts. And then in something in a passage that was actually read during our ordination service last night, Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. And there it says, Christ himself. So movements don't happen humanly catalyzed. It only happens by the Spirit of Christ. He gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be shepherds, some to be teachers. And they were to equip God's people for works of service. Then the body of Christ is built. And Paul, denominations, out of those roles, apostles, prophets, evangelists, they tend to be the early conductors of the Spirit, what the Spirit is catalyzing. They tend to be the ones that jumpstart a movement. Spiritual entrepreneurs. Spiritual entrepreneurs, kingdom entrepreneurs. Um... They're wired for that. And then the shepherds and teachers who are so necessary have a way of gathering that movement into congregations, shepherds, and to make sure they go deep in the word teachers. But denominations tend to emphasize shepherds and teachers, quite frankly, because they're a little easier to control and structure. And over time, denominations, often unintended, marginalize the roles that make them a little bit nervous. The apostolic. The apostolic type of multipliers. And that just takes the life out of a movement. And they become institutionalized. And so a movement to me is something that completely depends on the spirit of Christ to generate it. Does not presume in pride that it could create it itself. And then looks at the catalytic anointed people that are necessary and makes sure they are positioned to make their full contribution. And then is sure that these roles actually equip all believers because it's going to take all hands on deck. There's never been a movement that's been only clergy. It's always been key. And the one of the things I love about District Conference, we are clergy and laity together here. There's never been a movement without significant involvement of laity. And so a movement to me, different than many denominations, many denominations have become clergy-centered. 
and they tend to become homogeneous rather than diverse in terms of all ethnicities. And they've tended to become homogeneous in terms of ages, not all generations, but maybe one or two that are dominant. And so often it's men and not men and women who are fully expressing their gifts. So to me, completely dependent on the spirit, engaging those catalytic movement people, those early conductors, and then being sure everyone is included in the mission. It seems to me like if you've got the apes, the apostolic, prophetic, evangelist, and then the shepherd and the teacher, to be able to get all of those going in the same direction, the shepherds and the teachers might feel marginalized. Yeah. They might feel like there's not a place for them, that we're making these other people the tip of the spear and their role is not as important. How, how are you going to uh, walk that fine line? Yeah. Well, I do think there's a lot more shepherds and teachers than there is anything else. And I think that makes sense. Um, because apostolic people are people who tend to not only have a church in their heart, they have a movement in their heart. They think zip codes. They think reaching a territory. That's just the nature. So apostolic people in this district, I know some of them. They're not just thinking about their one location. They're thinking far beyond. So I think where the breakdown comes, and this is the work of the enemy, is that we either have role in envy. I'm this, but I wish I was that. Okay. And I don't celebrate who God has made me to be. Okay. Or we have role ego, which is who I am is more important to the kingdom or better or whatever. And it's either the envy or the ego to me that keeps the full engagement from ever happening. That's good. That's really good. So I think uh, shepherds and teachers, if the apostolic multipliers do their work, we will need shepherds and teachers more than ever, not less. They will become more important because there'll be more people being reached who need to be brought together into church families and taught deeply into the okay. word. So these apostolic people are out here starting fires and somebody has to come along behind them yeah. and clean up the messes they make on occasion. Yes, <laughs> and, and I like to say this because I, I, you know, some people uh, think because they've made a mess, they're an apostolic person. Um, <laughs> you can have a mess without a movement, okay? <laughs> Uh, some people have the gift of making messes, and it, it, it's not a biblical role at all. Uh, so you can have a mess without a movement, but I'm also convinced you cannot have a movement without it being a little messy. Okay. Because if you're too concerned about everything being in its place, there's a tendency, again, unintended, to quench the spirit and say God's got to work this way with these people in our systems, and before you know it, the movement's quenched. Wow. Now, I've been in meetings. This is good. You guys understand this is really good stuff. <laughs> Do we put them to sleep? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Time for a joke, one of your jokes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Susan, said, Susan said this morning that wasn't funny. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've been in meetings where you've talked about three things at the general board and you and the leaders, district superintendents, are beginning to work on, and let's unpack that just a little bit, the sending church, the adoptive church, yeah. and then the regional concept. So let's talk a little bit of, of the dream that, about the sending church. And you really do want to put them to sleep this morning, don't you? <laughs> um, so the big, the big question is, um, do we cause the movement to serve our structures, or do we develop structures that serve and support a movement, even if it's a little messier? And so three areas where we're actively exploring. One is how do local churches, because it's not districts that plant churches ultimately or denominations that plant churches. It's local churches that plant churches. Um, how do they um, how become fully positioned to make their contribution? And so we're exploring how to uh, help churches multiply and support them, and to develop their own networks, so to speak. So um, 
using the example here, is there a fusion network of churches that develops or campuses? And, and we're saying it's not one model. It's movement over model. Because in one community, that model may work best. The next community, another model may be best. Or this person, they're the type of leader that works with that model or a different model. So that's what we're trying to do to say uh, churches that are sending, churches that have a movement in their heart, not just a church itself, one location. They, they want to reach zip codes. How do we position them and honor the connections they form through networks? And this could actually go across the district lines. Could go across district State lines. State lines, wherever goes. Yeah, and one of the things that's limited us is we have this great people who are transferred to this city, and, you know, it's outside the district. It's across the nation or whatever. And, you know, what if a great couple from, again, using Fusion, because we're here as an example, you know, moves to Seattle, Washington. Well, why not think about starting a church there and still stay connected to Fusion and, and yet our districts adjust rather than saying, well, we, you've got to go through all this in order to do that. Okay. We have great gaps in our nation where we have nothing, quite frankly. And if... If local churches in one area get a vision of a, a church in a whole other area, boy, we've got to figure out how to let, you know, bless that. So a church in another district could send a group to Boston Absolutely. and be a sending church. Absolutely. In fact, that's been part of your heart and prayer, but uh, there could be a church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, who says, uh, boy, Boston's on our heart, or... Or one of their kids move, you know, one of the pastor's kids moves there. It's amazing all the different ways this happens. But what if the people who God wants to use to reach Boston aren't currently in eastern New York, New England? We certainly don't want to limit it if he wants to send them as missionaries to plant a church right. and to be part of what God's doing here. Second one is adoptive churches. Often churches have a life cycle, and without a renewal, a, a courageous commitment, and you know this better than I, so this would be a good chance for you to weigh in. And if they decline far enough, the, the church, the DBA, can say, you're going to be a developing church. You no longer have enough members or finances or whatever to remain an established congregation. But why wait until they've declined so far that it's almost impossible for there to be a resurrection. Why not earlier in this curve say, you could be adopted by another congregation, and that congregation could help you with people and a new vision and a fresh approach, and a renewal could take place while there's still some health and strength? What if... What if a church's greatest act of faith was later in its life cycle, where it just gives itself to say, God is obviously doing a fresh thing through you. We gift ourselves to you in order for that fresh work to happen in our community. Our buildings, our finances, our personnel, all of these things, we add it to your fire so and, that God can do a new thing. And, and in a real spirit of trust to say, and we trust you even though it's different and unfamiliar and so on, we trust what God's doing in you and we give you, we surrender, if you will, that to you. Um, boy, that'd be courageous. We have a United Methodist Church in the mountains of the Adirondacks who voted this week to become Wesleyan's petition their bishop to allow them to become a part of our district wow. because they sense that there's something here that they don't have there. Yeah, yeah. This is really, a, a, I think, a huge possibility. And we're starting to have churches be adopted, and uh, it's incredible to see what God's doing. Good. Third one is, um, you know, sometimes we have 30 districts, and um, that's a lot. And... Um, some of them have amazing cities and opportunities and um, zip codes uh, entrusted to them. And uh, with the, the size they're at, the resources they have, and often these colleagues like you, they have to be, like, do everything. They have to be complete generalist. So we're saying, and, and, and you have all these duplicate things of essential services. 
So we're saying, what if there's bigger districts or regions and they centralize some things so there's efficiency of scale and the district superintendents who serve in there become more specialist according to their strengths in that region versus trying to be all things to all people. And what is there to be gained by that region being led by someone who has that apostolic multiplier DNA in them? And so we're, we're just beginning to say, well, what does it look like for us to work together more centralize some things so that we can decentralize so that we, you don't have to be repeating and redundant and then and then allow specialists to work within their gifting to help serve and catalyze that movement so and you've set aside several locations the, as pilot or the general pilot. board has identified three um, pilots um, if you will uh, to to explore this one is in the west so the western area uh, one is in the great lakes and one is right here in the Northeast. Okay, fantastic. Uh, tell, did, I don't know if the people understand that out of all 30 of the, of the districts, we would not be in the top third as far as strength is concerned, nor would we be in the middle third. Uh, we would be very, very close to the bottom that after 175 years, we still have not broken out of small church mindset and uh, villages and, and small areas and reached the cities where the population bases are. But the denominational leaders are aware of that. Is that correct? Yeah, I, a couple things. One is you have one of the toughest mission fields within our mission field. I mean, you talk about secularization. Uh, it's happening in the Northeast within and you, you have shared those stats with me, and you're one of those who've awakened me to that. Now, that can be an excuse, or that can be a reason God loves to glorify himself in situations like that, and he loves to do it a new and a fresh thing. The second thing is um, you have to be careful how you measure strength. Sometimes it's measured only in attendance or finance or whatever. And it's true, Eastern New York, New England, by those measurements, is one of our smaller districts. Um, but part of what's making this place so dynamic, quite frankly, is some fresh strengths have developed. Um, you know, in terms of leadership development and peer learning groups, you guys have been in the top of our districts. Uh, in terms of revitalization and intentionality, intervention. You've, so there are strengths you bring that need to be celebrated and there's the reality that the mission field is um, one of those places where uh, it's, it's going to be God bringing glory to himself by the way he shows up and makes a difference here. I've said this to you in private. Let me say it to you in public. The people that are sitting here today in front of us are my heroes. They are the shock troops. We often grin and say it's fun to work behind enemy lines. Um, we do believe we're in a very, very secular part of the nation. But we've decided if we get up earlier and stay up later and turn over more rocks, there's still people that need Jesus Christ. That's right. And we're finding them that are yep. responding to the gospel. Amen. And God is raising up some of those uh, folks to help catalyze. I, I have a sense that um, there's a positioning going on, supernatural positioning, for the work God wants to do in the Northeast. Um, the ground is hard, uh, and uh, it'll take uh, all you can do and all God can do to, to create it. Some of the great movements have been here before. Yes. Um, do it again in our day, Lord. Sure. Nine years ago, when I arrived, by their own testimony, the district said that they were way over on the life cycle. And by the way, the first person that ever taught me about the life cycle of an organization was Wayne Smith. Um, who, back in the days, you, huh? remember, you remember that book that we got? <laughs> yeah. Um, but the district was way over on, toward the polarization and questioning and death part of the cycle. Yeah. There was a new vision, a new dream mm -hmm. uh, that came out of the revitalization, DTP we called it, yep. which brought fresh breath, fresh energy, fresh life yes. to, to the district. 
Yeah. And now we're beginning to sense that um, we're back up close to what the book called prime or mature, mm -hmm. and there needs to be a new a new day, mm -hmm. a new intervention, a new dream. Mm -hmm. um, just talk about how that. I mean, you've been through various life cycles, and and how do you sense that and and hear from God about that? Yeah. Um, what's happened here is miraculous in that it, it just demonstrates that once that downturn is happening, it's not inevitable that, you know, the only result is closure or whatever. Um, uh, so um, thank God that he can catch us in the life cycle and start a new cycle, start mm -hmm. a new movement. It's often um, challenging. It often involves life beyond comfort zones. Um, and sometimes the people who are part of the past won't necessarily be the people that are part of the future. There's a pruning process that goes on with that. Um, we have a good theology of growth. We don't have a good theology of pruning. The Bible has a lot to say about pruning. Uh, we, we've probably not wanted to think about that as much. Um, so. Um, thank the Lord that you have had the faith in, the, in this process to stay hand in hand with him. And um, I know many of your churches have made courageous choices yes, in order have. to see a new day. And the cumulative effect of that is beginning to create an overall momentum. Very good. Now you're aware, I assume, that I've told the district board that at the end of this term, my term, which ends in 2018, that I do not allow, I will not allow my name to be run. You another. told him what? I did. I did. I have this problem with this guy all the time. Uh, and say, you said what? <laughs> no, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. 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 And uh, so when we leave here today, I'll begin my last year mm -hmm. as district superintendent. In fact, even this morning as I was meditating, it was almost like God said, um, you're kind of like Moses going up on the mountain. And you're going to be able to look across. Hmm. Yeah. But you can't go with them. Hmm. I've taken dozens of people to the top of the Prudential Building in Boston. Hmm. And look, for nine years, we looked at that mission field. And we're going to get there. Amen. But I will not be here. I hope to leave it in very good shape so somebody can. Yeah, yeah. Talk a little bit about this revitalization thing which God has plugged into my heart and which seems to have opened doors I never dreamed possible until calls are coming yeah. from across the nation. And it's all because these folks were courageous and allowed me to get involved. Yeah. Well, that's a powerful picture of uh, Moses and... Uh, yeah, um, and I know you how much you love this place. Um, God has given uh, your DS a broader ministry in our movement. He has a particular gifting to uh, go into a local church that's experiencing challenges in their life cycle. Uh, he's winsome. He's warm. Even his quirky sense of humor is helpful in that setting. Not every setting, but in that setting, it tends to be helpful. Um, <laughs> he, uh, he's insightful, and he can say things in a straightforward way that awakens them, that often when you're in the system, you can't see it any longer. You're so much a part of it that the old saying, you can't see the forest for the trees. And... Uh, Boy, so many districts and churches have benefited from that. So we're grateful that he doesn't say, okay, um, number one, I'm grateful. I, I think this next year he'll still be bringing people to Boston and still taking them up. So I don't expect he's going to coast at all during this next year. Um, but at the same time, I'm glad he's not just saying, okay, um, I'm retiring. Um, even though if you've been married 45 years, you must be like at that retirement age. I'm just saying. Uh, he's not saying I'm just riding off and, you know, uh, 
doing whatever you do, uh, but he, he was saying, I want to keep serving, keep ministering, and we're very excited about the possibility of him doing, you know, 12, 15, 20, 25, whatever the number is uh, of these weekends across our movement. We have uh, just under 1,600 churches. Almost one quarter of them are 30 or less in morning worship. That used to be, when we were just farming communities, that used to be a sustainable number when you had family farms. It's really hard. It's getting harder and harder to, for a church of 30 to even exist, let alone impact its zip code. A half our churches are under 60. Three quarters of our churches are under 125. So if we're going to make an impact in our zip codes, God's going to help some churches to experience a new day. And your district superintendent is going to continue to be part of that and maybe even have greater freedom to do so uh, a year or so from now. So. You spoke about that period when you were between here and here and not knowing what was going to happen. I was in that period when I came here. Mm -hmm. I had been to uh, Zambia with Dr. Lyon and I thought maybe I was going to work at World Hope. I thought maybe I was going to be put on a shelf and never have a place again. And I wrote an article based on David Livingston's life. His heart was buried there in Africa. Hmm. They found him praying under the tree. The article was, Where Will Your Heart Be Buried? Hmm. And it became obvious that he was asking me to bury my heart for the last part of my ministry in the Northeast, huh. where I knew nobody, where I'm such a fish out of water. I talk to people who scowl at me. <laughs> when I order at McDonald's, they can't understand what I'm saying. Those kind of things. It but is God, a cross-cultural experience, it, it is isn't a cross, it? Yeah. A language challenge? Where they pronounce Peabody, Peabody. I, I cannot understand this. Uh, but God put me here. And I've tried to bloom where I've been planted. Yeah, and your heart's here. Yeah, and it, yeah, my heart is here. So, with this in mind, you talking about regions, me understanding that God is allowing me to go to the uh, edge of the land but not into the land, uh, I got a phone call from a larger district that borders us and said, do you think maybe it's time we should start talking about pooling our resources so that we can leverage those to reach the great northeast. I thought, what a revolutionary idea. <laughs> We've had 175 years to do it and just haven't been able to break loose. Church planting has been, a, quite frankly, a disaster across the years. We just haven't mastered that. And so the Penn Jersey District uh, began to court us. And folks, I told them that years and years and years, we felt like the middle... The middle school girl with braces and a bad case of acne <laughs> and arms and legs too long for their body. But when I got that phone call, I hung up and said, the braces are gone, the acne is cleared up, we have grown into our body, and now we are desirable by the high school quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> there you go. Uh, that, <laughs> so, whether that's politically correct or not, <laughs> I don't know. Too late. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, with that in mind, we went to the uh, your DBA, and the Penn Jersey went to their DBA to ask if this might be a possibility. And each DBA voted unanimously to proceed with talks. Yep. We put together an MET, yep. a merger exploratory team, and we met in Poughkeepsie, New York, about two weeks ago to get to know one another. The atmosphere in the room was very good hmm. and uh, decided that we should perhaps continue this and see where God led us. Mm -hmm. On uh, Wednesday night of this week, I traveled to uh, Cherryville, Pennsylvania to be in their district conference, a 
quite larger district conference than this one, but uh, still a district conference. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. But you have indicated to the district superintendent there and to me that we each have a different DNA that we would bring to the table. Can you just uh, talk about that a bit? Yeah, in some ways, you know, being in the Northeast, there's some natural affinities and so on. Um, but uh, Penn Jersey uh, and uh, Carl can certainly uh, articulate this beyond what I can, but it, it has a strength of um, an amazingly diverse uh, district family. And uh, different nationalities, um, different contexts. Um, I mean, they, uh, they have rural churches, they have suburban churches, they have urban churches. Um, when you look out over their conference family, you see many nations um, represented in New York City and in other places. Um, so it, and thankfully they are also leaders in our movement uh, with women fully utilizing their gifts in ministry. They have more churches led as senior pastors by women than percentage wise than any district in our denomination. <coughs> so um, they've had the ability for all hands on deck to engage people. They have a proven track record of that. Second thing is, and I know this is on your heart, they have a strength that's growing in urban context. Um, places like Manhattan and, and, and throughout New York City. Now, they would be quick to say, we haven't cracked the code on this, and anybody who does, I'm a little bit suspect because urban work is challenging work. Boston is a challenging mission field, certainly. But, um, and they have burdens for cities like Philadelphia where God's yet to give them that kind of a strength like they have in New York City. But they've got a multiplying church happening in New York City. And um, so that urban ministry um, has been huge. So when I think about your strengths here in revitalization and, and your strengths in... Um, uh, reaching, uh, having a heart for secular culture, et cetera, and, uh, and then in leadership development. Um, and then when I think about the combination that comes with uh, the all hands on deck that's happening there and the uh, urban uh, initiative, there, there seems to be synergy there. Um, so, you know, I, I, again, you and Carl could articulate that much more fully, but that's how I see it from a bit of an outside looking in. So I went down and, uh, and was hung out with him for a couple of days. A lot of uh, ethnicity, yep. a larger setting, obviously. They, where we would have 3,000 on Sunday morning, they would have 10. Uh, where we would have $4 million income, they would have 12. Um, but uh, Dr. Carl, who's the district superintendent there, began to introduce this idea to this conference in what I thought was purely a uh, exploratory manner, just to let me tell you what might be happening. But the more he talked, the, lo the more there seemed to be a sense of unity and something developing in the conference. Yeah, don't blame him completely because uh, you added some fuel to the fire while you were there. So. <laughs> 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 As only you can do. <laughs> I sat, but I sat right. and smiled at all the old ladies. That's what I did. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, it, was, it was an amazing thing. It was. Um, and um, so it appears that had they taken a vote that day, they would have jumped all over this. Now, I told them right up front, you were sitting there beside me, that we were not interested in being swallowed up by a bigger organization and them just go on doing their thing. But it would have to be somehow where we could mix our DNA with their DNA and bring what we have to the table. You want to comment about, I bet it may be a hard question for you, but uh, you think that's a possibility when there's such a difference in size? 
Well, uh, it all begins in the heart of the DS, and that's Carl's heart. Um, you, you view strength from many angles, and he recognizes the strengths that are here. Um, I was part of a merger when, where two districts merged recently, Crossroads District. I led their merger exploratory team, and uh, this was before I was in this role. One was more sizable than the other, but what made it more of a joining and a partnering in, in that merger was the recognition of strengths that included numbers but was not limited to numbers. Um, that's their heart and their spirit. The thing I loved that day was it wasn't about organization. It, wasn't about, it was about mission. And as you told the stories of the cities and the secular cities in Boston, God began to move on their hearts. And so I don't even think it's on their mind of organizationally our district swallowing another district. It's we're in the Northeast together, and there's a great mission field, and how can we help each other get into as many zip codes as possible? Wow. And that's the spirit of it. And as long as that's the spirit of it, then that'll be bigger than any uh, little organizational takeover thinking, sure. which is foreign to what's going on sure. right now. So just to wrap this up, and uh, I was what wondering I'm, when we were going to do that. Yeah, <laughs> I've been I, on the hot seat a while here, so I've enjoyed. I've it. enjoyed this. This is my report, guys. I've enjoyed this a lot more than me reading something to you. <laughs> I think it's been fantastic. You've gotten to see his heart. Um, can you just sum up? And I'm going to bring Doc, Dr. Carl East, like the DS from down there, is present, but in time and the way I'm working our schedule here. I'm gonna, I'll have some time with him after you've gone, even. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to wrap this up. So I can't listen in? You can live, <laughs> you can live stream it from, <laughs> the air, okay. from the airport waiting room. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, we have other things. Yep. But, uh, and I'm sure that... Uh, well, I, I completely trust you guys, and so uh, I think it's going to be a great conversation. Yeah. Um, can I just make one final comment? Um, the, the tensions that will emerge are inevitable. And one of the things we're learning as a movement is you have to have big relationships so that the trust is always greater than the tension. The goal is not to try to do something that's tension-free because no change is tension-free. The goal is to have a level of trust so that you can address the tensions. You can be honest about them, you can name them, and you can join together in addressing them. And I think that's part, just a part of what Jesus had in mind when he said the greatest commandment, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, that's a big relationship. Yeah. Have a big relationship with God, and love your neighbor as yourself, that's a big relationship. And as long as there's trust over tension, you'll get through it. And uh, so, I'm excited about the trust that's developing even in initial conversations, praying that it grows, because that'll give you the freedom to address the inevitable tensions that are part of the process. So, thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to say to our folks? Now, when, when we finish here, we're going to get this out of the way. And I've asked our people to put together a video highlighting life change in our district this past year. I think it's going to be something you're really going to be fired up about. I'm looking forward to it. I want to sit down and just and watch what uh, Andrew and his team, and then all of you, your pastors, you've taken your iPhones and put together, and it's amazing what has been able to happen. But before we go to that particular, and then we'll go to break. So break will be about 1030. This video is about 19 minutes. Then when you hear the band playing at the end of break, get back in here because shortly Sherry will do her uh, financial part about that time. And then we'll have another video, a second video that they put together. And um, I just want you to understand you are the reason. And there's a ton of ministry taking place in the Northeast. Yeah, there is. Uh, tremendous life change. Even seeing some of the worship leadership coming from the different churches and so on. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, when, when my colleagues come up here for 6SU or things like this, they often go away saying, I had no idea huh. that in the Northeast, and it's because of what God is doing yeah. in the churches. 
but just sum up what what you're feeling about uh, our district this day your through the nomination just uh this would be your time to just uh yeah well i uh have a special place in my heart for this district as well you know my first district ordination and my first district conference in this role were here I uh, left Buffalo on Thursday, and I flew here on Friday. And uh, so read, Su read Susan's book on the plane. <laughs> read, read Susan's book on the plane. Great book. Have been recommending it. Um, but what popped into my mind, and I won't blame God for it, but it just seems uh, is Romans twelve three. Um, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. There's a little bit of a danger when God begins to do a new thing that you get a bit of a swagger and you begin to think, oh, yeah. So, but the other side of that, Romans 12, 3, but think of yourself with a measure of faith. Don't think that's what has happened is all that is going to happen. It's just the beginning. It's just the start. Have the faith. So stay out of both ditches, you know. <laughs> thinking of yourself more highly, thinking of yourself without faith, uh, and walk the road you're on, and God's going to honor it. So it's, it's been great to share this table time with you, brother. So, yeah. yeah.